Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the third uh, segment of A Fresh Perspective to Reading the Gospels. This evening, I hope to be able to share with you four particular passages as how we could actually apply some of the things that we have talked about. Uh, and as we begin, I, I would like you to be mindful that uh, whatever you hear, uh, whatever you see, uh, and, and as you explore, I, I trust that you would actually do your own research, uh, verify and check, uh, because that's important. Uh, learning new things is nice sometimes uh, out of curiosity, but essentially it's important for us to realize that uh, whether we are actually looking at the right things the right way and whether that's reasonable as an explanation to the text that we are reading. Now, what we have done in the last couple of weeks when I spoke about the fresh perspective is really very much to help us better understand the context of the Gospels that we are reading, uh, the, the words that it's being used, that it is not Greek understanding, but very much the understanding of the people of the day, how Jesus would express that. Uh, the practices that they are more or less are doing, uh, that they are practicing as part of their religious environment, as well as their cultural environment. Relationships uh, between husbands and wives, uh, and children and the family, within the community, uh, between God and man, uh, between the father and son. Now, all these are relationships where you find that it is not a Greek idea. Then we talked about the importance of God in their lives. And as Jesus explains that in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, it should come from their background and their perspective. And when we talk about his word, we're talking about the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, as, as Jesus would have described, the scriptures. And particularly to put ourselves into the lives of those described in the Gospels. That's how we came about to this point. And so this evening, I would like us to immerse ourselves into the audience. Uh, I, I trust that we'll be able to appreciate the events, the actions, the emotions, and the thinking behind the narratives that we are going to look at, four passages, and I hope that we can actually put ourselves into their shoes. Again, we are doing a, a CSI of sorts uh, as a good detective of what truth is, of what Jesus said, and how it was understood. The five W's and the how uh, perhaps becomes a very useful base for us to investigate exactly what we read. Now, if we need more help, we need to study the culture. And I'll share with you a little bit about culture, the language, and particularly the Old Testament. Uh, most importantly is for us to go and find out for ourselves. So don't take my word for it. More importantly is for you to ask yourselves uh, how that would uh, mean and what it would mean to you. Now, I'm, I'm trying to help us alter our thought patterns, uh, to adjust our perspective of the Gospels. Whatever we may know about the Gospels, uh, whatever we may have been taught about the Gospels, I ask that we, for the time being, put that aside. Most importantly, is not to jump straight in into the passage and try to understand the English. Uh, that is what I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we will achieve out of this session. Uh, we need to, first of all, ask ourselves, how did the people then, if we were seated there with them as Jews listening to Jesus, how would they understand what was said? Because Jesus didn't speak in, in, um, in, in English. Uh, he obviously, as I had su suggested, he, he probably didn't speak in Greek. He, he taught them from the Hebrew language because he was very much referring to the Torah and the Tanakh. And why? Because that was the beginning of his uh, preaching, his teaching. 
Uh, and, and very importantly, uh, to realize that he is the teacher of the scriptures, the words of his father. And so at this point in time, try and try very hard not to jump into the English, not to understand it from a pure English language, definitely not from a Greek perspective. Try to understand the original context first, no matter how simple the English may be, because it will surprise you this evening that the simplest English words may not mean exactly what we think they mean. And so let me introduce you to four passages. I have picked four passages, and these are some of the harder passages, but I would spend more time on the first passage so that you would be able to go through the video again, slowly digesting some of the things that we discuss in more detail, and then in the following passages to observe how the explanation might come about and to help us open up the text from a more... Hebrew perspective, since we are seated there with Jesus, listening to him, telling us these words. So I would ask that um, you do not be too surprised. Uh, you may hear things for the first time. You may hear things that might sound a bit shocking to you. But nevertheless, ask yourselves the question, is this how it would be understood if we were Jews with them at that time? When we are listening to Jesus, is that what he is trying to express to us? And definitely, it would not be an English perspective. Shall we begin? Our first passage is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Now, the slides would be familiar because I've taken them from last week, but we will now spend more time on the details. Not just the questions, but the answers. How do we find some of these answers? Now, I've asked many questions, and questions are what we all must ask. Do not assume the English meaning. And so for now, we put aside everything that we know, uh, that we have been taught, or we have read, or we have heard from all the days of our lives. And then let's listen to what Jesus has to say as we're seated there before him at the northern shore of the Galilee. And this is what he says in Matthew 5, 17 to 20. So let's take a look. He says, do not think that I came. So basically, it's telling us that don't, don't for a moment misunderstand what he is saying. And then he had the words destroy, destroy, and fulfill. So these are contrasting words. More importantly, I just want to get to the crux of this, the law and prophets. And you will know that the law and prophets is representative of the Tanakh. And we'll get there shortly. So if you look at all of these, the entire passage is not about doing away with the law and the prophets. The passage is about making sure that everything that God has said will be fulfilled. And that is the, 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 the crux of this matter. So let me just help us go through the questions. And like I said, this first passage, we'll do a little bit more detail. And this is what we will get if we do the details. So look at the questions. So let's look at this. Law. So understand at this point in time when Jesus said the law and the prophets, he is speaking about the Torah. And if you have a Bible dictionary, a Strong's Concordance, an interlinear, you would find that there is a meaning to the word Torah. And we have translated it as law, and I'll share with you uh, what it may mean. 8451 is the number, so you should be able to identify that in your own time. We are talking about the Torah portion of the Tanakh. And so you see the word Tanakh. Tanakh. And this is the Torah. This is the Nevi'im. And this is the Ketuvim. 
And so these are what we call the writings, the prophets, and the law. And by, by in essence, what Jesus is trying to say is, he is coming out in full support of everything that has been in the scrolls, the Tanakh, which makes up of what we call the, the Old Testament, but to them, they are the scrolls of the Tanakh. All right? So now with the law, we have the prophets, it's the Nevi'im. And, and even more important is for us to go and examine how the Jews look at the prophets and how important are the Hebrew prophets. And that would be important for us to find out as a deeper background. So Deuteronomy 18 would be your passage to go to. And then it says heaven and earth, and the English heaven and earth, Reminds us of Genesis 1.1. It is the skies and the land. What is above and what is below. It is not talking about the signs and the universe. The yacht and the tittle. And we will, I have got a little bit of a few slides to show you how we could understand this. A pass from the law. That it would not move away from the law. The Torah would not just go away. And so whatever we may have been told about the law, Jesus is not saying that the law is going to go away. Then we have the words destroy and fulfill. Uh, in simple terms, not in English terms, but in Hebrew terms, this would mean to wrongly interpret or to properly interpret. So to wrongly interpret is to destroy the law. To properly interpret is to fulfill the law. To make it mean what it is intended. Then we have the word break. Break is to lose in the Greek. But in the Hebrew, it is to step upon. It is to disgrace it and to abuse it. And so it is important then for us to have that Hebrew mentality. If you were a Jew seated there, you won't think of breaking the law as loosening it and setting it free you would see breaking the law as para, which is to step on the law and completely disregard it. Commandments are important as a Jew. These are instructions, charge for us to do something. The word does is important because as Orientals, as all of us here are Orientals, and you would understand one thing. In the Oriental way of life, and the Hebrew people are also Oriental, they are all very practical and pragmatic people. The doing of things is important. The thinking of things is not as important. Now to the Greeks, the thinking is absolutely important, the abstracts of things. But to the Hebrew, as to the Chinese, the doing of things is what is important. Because you can see it matters. It has a result to it. Righteousness. Righteousness means what is right before God. When we do things which is considered right by God, that God says, this is what I want you to do, and you do it, that is righteousness. So it is not any abstract concepts. Exceeds, better than, least, the little ones. Great. Consider it great. Enter. Remember, it's practical. You can see you are going to be a part going into a place. There is a literal movement. That's what enter means. Kingdom of heaven. To them, the kingdom is real. It is not a figment of imagination. When Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 says, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When he talks about the kingdom, when Jews think of a kingdom, they are not thinking a spiritual kingdom. They are talking about the Messiah, the Mashiach. And hence, that is the positioning that I hope to be able to frame your mind. That don't look at this from a Greek perspective or from a Western perspective, but very much from a Hebrew perspective. Who are the scribes? They are teachers of the law. They know the law. If they don't know the law, who else would? Because they make copies of the scrolls. 
They teach the law. The Pharisees are the elite class of the religious Jews. Actually, the two groups of people that Jesus mentioned in this passage are the ones that are deemed to know the word of God the best. But yet we are told to be better than them. So why did Jesus say, I say to you? Because he's here to clarify and instruct the proper meaning. This is to fulfill the law, to explain the law in the correct way. Now, I hope that you will go back and review this part of the video slowly so that you will get the gist of it once again. Now, if you go around looking for books, there is a good book by David Biven, and this is his name here, right? Right here. David Biven has written a couple of books, but I am trying to suggest to you that these are books that come from a Jewish perspective. You'd be surprised. There are many, many books now in the market that is trying to help us understand words from Jesus' Jewish context, not from the Greek nor the Western context. And so these are what he speaks about the law how the rabbis will discuss the law and argue with each other. And that if he is misinterpreting it, he says, you're cancelling the law, you're destroying the law. But when you are explaining it correctly and they agree, you are fulfilling the law. Now, we will not get this from modern Western books. So I suggest that it would be useful for us to read some Hebrew texts and, and look at some Hebrew uh, websites as well to open up our eyes to how they would see some of these words. We're not behaving. We're not going to become Jews. We just need some insight as how these things are said so that we are not reading it from a 21st century Christian mind. It needs to be the first century Jewish mind. And Jesus is out here teaching the law, the Torah. Now, the other one was the yod and the tittle, the jot and the tittle. So, uh, that, that's how it's uh, read in the Greek. Now, the jot, there is no jot in the, in the Greek. There is a yod in the Hebrew. And these are how it is written. The tittle is that little marking right here. These little hooks. So let me explain to you what these little hooks actually mean. We call these hooks the cots of a yod. The yod is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet or alphabet. And this is how it's usually written, right? And hence, when you write it this way, we have the tag and then we have the cots. This is the cots. That's little, little... Uh, marker that just juts below the line. This, as they write the Hebrew scrolls, the Torah scrolls, they would not miss that little cuts of a yod. Because if they miss that, they would have to rewrite the whole thing again. It is that important. And so what Jesus was actually saying is very simple. These little markers, the little things in the Torah, which most of us, if we are not schooled in the Hebrew, we wouldn't care. But Jesus is saying, not one jot or tittle. And the word tittle, which is a Greek word uh, that's translated, it is actually from the Hebrew word kots, or the carrier, which is the horn. So it looks like a little horn. And so that's where we get the word tittle. So all you need to know is the yod and the kots are the two smallest markers and letters in the Hebrew language. And the Hebrew language is used to write the Torah and the whole Tana. And Jesus is saying not a single mark will pass away until all has been fulfilled. And that would give you a better understanding. If you were seated there, you would hear Jesus say that. What would your attitude to the Torah be? Now, our 
attitude to Torah today, as I told you, we need to set that aside. We've been told, oh, it's not important. It's already been fulfilled. Uh, Jesus has done that, and we don't need to think about that anymore. If you were a Jew seated there listening to Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, now Walter Kaiser is an authority uh, on the Hebrew Scriptures, and he tells us this, that Torah is not merely a collection of prohibitions, structures, or observance. It is a narrative of blessings and promises of God offered to one person, Abraham, and his family, but it's through them to the whole world will be blessed. We are called to believe and faith, and it is seen as directions as to how believers ought to act, live, and comfort themselves. When Jesus speaks of the Torah, if you were seated there hearing Jesus, you would be looking at the Torah as directions of God. Now, don't take my word for it. If you go to Genesis chapter 26, verse 5, you would see the word Torah for the first time right here. There is a Strong's number, H8451. And it tells you that it is direction, instruction, and law. That's exactly what it is. It doesn't mean our modern day law. It literally means directions and instructions. We have seen this before because we were talking about the fear of God. The word is yara. And in yara, it's about throwing the finger, pointing with the finger, flowing of water. Now from that word, we get a derivative. And the derivative is about the former rain, but also about the teaching, the Torah. It comes from exactly the same. It is a depiction of a direction where waters flow in a river, where you point a finger or shoot an arrow that directs you to a particular direction. And so Torah literally means the direction one is to take in life. Although the English is translated as law, we should look at this as directions of how God has given us to live by so that we will know him. Now, that is what the Torah would mean to the Jew. Now we come to the more questions section. We talked about the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus says that you must exceed. So if you were seated there, you would be thinking, how can you be better than the scribes and the Pharisees? And Jesus says, you must be. Because these scribes and Pharisees had also some bad lessons learned, which is a lot of the oral Torah that goes against the written Torah. And so the people need to learn like what Jesus is explaining. This is the spirit of things. This is what God wants us to know. That is the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. Does this have to do with the Torah? Absolutely. Why must the law be fulfilled? It must be explained properly so that we do not have anything that miss out the directions of God. Because if we misunderstand the Torah, we would have the wrong instructions and we would end up in the wrong place. What do we know about the law and the prophets? We can. That's the Tanakh. And so for our own sakes, we should read the entire Old Testament, particularly the first five books, so that we have a much better understanding when we go through the Sermon on the Mount again. Righteous. That's doing what God wants. It's as simple as that. Fulfillment of the law. Beyond just explaining and interpreting the law correctly, fulfillment of the law also refers to parts of the scripture where it must come to pass. And there are many prophecies in the Old Testament, including in the book of the law. And so these are what Jesus is saying. Nothing is going to go away until everything is fulfilled. Everything means everything. So not a yot or a kotz. So what prophecies is Jesus speaking about? Remember Matthew chapter 4, he came out saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It has to do 
with the kingdom prophecies. And these are prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. And that's the coming kingdom. So if you sat down there to listen to all these, you would understand that Jesus is not at all saying that the law is not important. You would actually hear the opposite, that the law is very important. And not a single court or tittle, we call it in the, in the Greek, or the yod, the smallest little character or consonant, it's not going away until everything is brought to pass. And so we have a Tanakh that is alive, that much of the prophecies are still to come. And so it is an exciting position that Jesus is explaining. So when we are seated there listening to him, we are actually hearing him explain properly what the Tanakh is actually saying, why he is addressing the Torah, so that we have a much better and clearer understanding than the scribes and the Pharisees who just copy it down and gives us instructions that is contrary to what God has said. So I leave this with you so that you can go back and review it in the video and, and think it through. This is Jesus speaking, and he is not at all saying that everything is going to be fulfilled. He is saying that everything needs to be fulfilled, not necessarily by him. He is just stating a statement of fact. Now, coming to passage number two, three, and four, we will not go through that kind of a detail. But I would still want to highlight to you some of the things that we need to think about. A second passage here speaks about something quite sensitive and, and there's been a lot of debate about it. So let me just highlight to you and so that you would have a gist of what it says and that you would be able to wrestle with it in your own time and way. So we talked about Matthew chapter 5 from verse 27 to verse 30. These few verses speaks about a very sensitive topic on adultery. And we had asked ourselves a number of questions. What is adultery? What, are, what about looking? Who is this woman? What does it mean to lust for her? What does heart mean? What is hell? Perish? Profitable? And these are words that we must explain. Otherwise, a passage has no meaning. And so let us begin. Whenever we talk about adultery, now in the modern day, we have many definitions to it and there are laws to it and there's a lot of criticism about it. We're not concerned about what the modern day laws talk about. As I had said, let's put aside all our modern thinking and our modern understanding of you shall not commit adultery and that's part of the Ten Commandments. And if we don't even read the Ten Commandments, then, then we don't have much to think about. And so, let's take a good look at this word adultery. There are two meanings. One is to, uh, to, to have illicit uh, sex. But the other word is even more important and potent because adultery is a metaphor of going after other gods. And God in Jeremiah chapter 3 has spoken about how Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, have both played treachery, pretended that they didn't do, but they actually did, worship other gods. And that is called adultery. And God is very hot against adultery because he says, there shall be no other gods before me. That Israel shall not be the wife of other gods. Although there are no real gods, the fact that Israel went after other gods and served them is a metaphor of a wife going after other husbands. Now, in this particular passage, adultery is particularly re with reference to the man. You can see that in the Old Testament, adultery has always to do with both the man and the woman. But in this particular passage, it's only the man. 
So you must understand that there are peculiarities as Jesus have described. And so listen to what he says. But I say to you, means I'm trying to explain this to you. You have heard the scribes and the Pharisees just say, you shall not commit adultery and whack the law on you. But I'm saying to you, whoever, any one of you, and we are talking about men. We're not talking about women. You notice this? This is not your typical discussion of a, an adultery question. Whosoever or whoever the man looks, look is literally to look. The question that you need to ask yourself is, in the Hebrew context, as God has made man and woman, is it wrong for a man to look at a woman? Why did God make women beautiful? So that man can close his eyes. That, that would be very strange. But it says here, whosoever looks at a woman. Now we need to define the word woman. Now the first thing that you need to ask yourself is, what does woman actually mean? I know at this point in time, this question sounds so odd. I mean, why do we even ask this question? What does woman actually mean? Woman means something. And let me just explain to you, not in the English, not in the Greek, but in the Hebrew. Woman is Isha. And in the old days, in the Hebrew context, as well as the old Chinese ancient context, you find that they never used the, the term husband or wife. They would use the term man and woman. That this is my woman or this is my man. So woman means Isha. And so Isha is the definition or the Hebrew word for woman. And it has two peculiar meanings. One is that it is the female gender as the womankind. And Ish would be the masculine, the mankind. However, woman also has another meaning that is our modern day wife. Man would be the modern day husband. And so if you read the marriage definition, and the man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his woman, and the two shall become one flesh. That is how it should be interpreted. So when you look at this word woman, we're not talking about just any woman. In the Hebrew, it would be a married woman. And what does a married woman mean in Hebrew? A married woman means that she belongs to a man. And when one woman belongs to a man, adultery is a crime because another man would be stealing or taking ownership of a woman who already belongs to another man. And that is the word lust for her. That is covetousness. You know, in the part of the uh, Ten Commandments, you shall not covet. That's the same word, lust. It is not about lustful as the modern day concept. It's unfortunate that we have that English word. This is about looking at a woman with full intention of taking her for his own when she already belonged to somebody else. And then Jesus says, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That's another word that we need to define, the word heart. The word heart in the Hebrew is the seat of the mind, the understanding. It is not emotions. It is the understanding, the faculty of us making choices. And so when a man looks at a woman with the intention to covet and to take 
her as his own has already made up his mind to commit adultery. And so this is how the Hebrew would understand adultery. It is about a choice. It is about making something, taking something that does not belong to him to make it belong to him. Now in the old days, if you read the book of Genesis, uh, marriage is actually when it is consummated. And so when a married man takes a married woman who belongs to another man, God views this as criminally bad. And hence, there is a law prescribed for adultery. But we will ask the next question, what happens if the woman is not married? And then we will see that. Now, verse 29 to verse 30 has a very curious way of saying things. You would be able to look at this because the Hebrew people and the Chinese people, like us, ourselves, are, are exaggerators in a sense. When we want to make a point, uh, we would tend to exaggerate ourselves to make us be aware that it is so important that you don't even come close to this problem. So if your eye, right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, you know, that kind of thing. And so it is to say that don't even go there. Uh, otherwise, uh, God would be so angry that he will hit the roof. So it's an idiom. And so the idea that we need to understand is this is how the Hebrew speaks. And it's to use superlatives and exaggeration to make a point so that you don't cross that line. That's basically where we're coming from. So what is the idea of hell here? Unfortunately, the word hell is not Hades. It is actually Gehenna, which is uh, at the south part of the old Jerusalem city, where outside the walls, they would be burning rubbish and anything else that needs to be destroyed. That is where Jesus is saying, it is better to cut off your hand than to be thrown into the fire. This has nothing to do with the idea of Sheol, which is the Hebrew idea. This is to say that don't, don't waste yourself, don't even cross that line because the punishment for adultery is stoning to death. So Jesus is merely saying, don't even go there. Don't even go there. Now, let me en encourage you to read Deuteronomy chapter 22 for a better understanding of adultery. Uh, just for a moment, I want you to understand that the woman that we have read is Isha. There is also a young woman called Alma. A young woman is a woman that is hidden in the house that is marriageable but has not come out yet. And so if she is out, she would be veiled. A married woman is unveiled. The other word that we come across in the Hebrew is called Bethula, which is virgin. That has to do with uh, her, her sexual history. So there are three words that we need to be aware of in the Hebrew. Bethula, Alma, and Isha. Now, the, the interesting thing even till today you would find is this. When a woman is unmarried, she would be veiled when she is walking out. She is supposed to be hidden. The word Alma is hidden. The Isha, on the other hand, would be unveiled. She would be exposed. And so, because she is exposed, then the man could actually look at her and if he crosses that line, God, Jesus is saying that that would be committing adultery. Right? So that, that is how I think you could actually see that from a more Hebrew viewpoint. So go back and think about it. Uh, it does change some of the thinking that we, we might have had. Let us look at the third passage, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, a reasonably short two verses. It speaks of the broad way and the narrow way. And so again, all these words are important. These are action words. Enter means you have to locate yourself from point A into point B. And then it speaks of gate and the type of gate. And then you would see that there is this 
Hebrew way of saying things. Wide is the gate. Broad is the way. What does it mean? Wide and broad are both very similar terms. And, and the Jews love this kind of expression. Saying the same thing twice in slightly different way as a part of an emphasis. So that you understand that you do not want to go into destruction, to perish. This is what it means. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Destruction, this is what it means. That there are many who go in by it. Then it says, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way. So narrow and difficult is about the same. And it says it's confined, very tight, but it leads to life. Again, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So all you need to know is that life here and life is John 3, 16 means exactly the same thing. And now let me explain this to you in a clearer meaning. First of all, let me show you what gates are. This is a small narrow gate and, and this gate fits one person. This is a narrow gate that is found along the walls of Jerusalem and it's only meant for one person to squeeze through. Now, today we can go through the dung gate, and that's big. Many people can cross. You would be able to see this view here from the Mount of Olives. If we look across, there's this little gate, which is called the Eastern Gate or the Beautiful Gate. But it is covered, you notice. This part is covered because uh, when, the Mus when the Muslims came into Jerusalem in the 7th and 8th century, uh, they sealed the walls, they sealed the gate so that uh, Jesus would not be able to return. Uh, that's, that's their intent. So the gate is sealed. But it's a huge gate and it's bigger than the Dung Gate. Now right up north at Dan, tell Dan, right up north, this is the ancient gates that you've got the walls. And this is the path to go in. And so when we talk about why, this is why. And this is broad. Because it's about the way. So it is important for us to be very clear that this is what we are speaking about. When it's wide, it is flat and spread out. When it's broad, it's spacious, like a big highway. When it's narrow, it's tight and difficult. What difficult means is compressed. Basically, it means the same thing. And this is what I am hoping to show you. We have the broad gate, the wide gate, and then the wide path. And many people are on it. But the end of this gate is destruction. Then we have the next comparison, the narrow gate. And narrow is the way. And few will find it. But at the end of it is life. And so what we see is this. These are the contrasts. If you look at John 3, 16, eternal life. Life is behind the gate. When you enter the narrow gate, you find life. But when you enter the broad gate, you find destruction. This is basically what Jesus is speaking. We don't have gates that we know because people don't pass through gates that we do. We only have toll gates. What we do see is this. This is the end of the journey. All right? The end of the journey. So John 3.16 also speaks of the end of the journey. 
to make sure that we are on the right path and that we will end at the right destination. So when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me, speaks about exactly the same. Follow his way and he will get to life and because beyond that is where the Father is. So I leave this for you to think about. The important thing is you need to enter. Remember the word enter. It is a motion, it's a movement from point A to point B. Enter by the narrow gate. And that would mean enter into life. So all these are very imagery-based illustration of teachings that Jesus has. So let's look at our last passage. And this would be the possibly one of the harder passages in the New Testament that many people are struggling with. But it is not that difficult after all. Think with me. We are all Jews. We are seated there with Jesus and we are listening to what he is saying. And he's saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So remember, entering is a movement. You need to be a part of. You actually go in. So enter by the narrow gate. But who enters the kingdom of heaven? He who does the will of my Father in heaven. So this is point number one. The, does the will of the Father in heaven. Now, then Jesus immediately goes on to describe something else. Verse 22, he says, Many will say to me in that day, what is that day? Judgment day. In the Hebrew mind, they always know that there will be judgment after this. And so in that day, people will say to Jesus, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these things, prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then Jesus said something very shocking. I, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And we will spend some time here. Now, why does Jesus say, I never knew you? Does it mean that Jesus never ever knew them? No. This is exaggeration. The Hebrew people love exaggeration. When you are trying to reject somebody, it is as good as I don't know you. So in the Chinese family, you know, when, when the father sometimes, uh, you see the story that he's so angry. He says, I never gave birth to you. Right? Go away. So that's an exaggeration. So Jesus says, I don't know you. It's an exaggeration. Why? Because he's so angry. You, have, you say you do all these things. But Jesus says, I don't know you. Why? Because you, this is what you do. This is number two. And so this is where I would want to spend a few minutes explaining this to you. Number one, all these things are unimportant. Doing all these things has no meaning to Jesus. In the day of judgment, none of this matters except if you do the will of my Father in heaven. You see, Jesus for his entire life on earth says that I'm here to do the will of my Father. My, the food, my food is to do the will of my Father. And then the word practice lawlessness is what I want to, you to see. These are the important words here. Lawlessness, will of my Father in heaven. Practice means character and conduct. So let me just explain this to you. Will of my Father. Will of my Father fundamentally and literally means what God so desires. What he wants So in a relationship with anyone, whether it's a guy or a girl, or in, in any 
good intimate relationships, how do you know to please the other person but to find out what he or she likes and dislikes? And you do what he or she likes and you don't do what he or she dislikes. In the case of God, our Father in heaven, his will is something that we have to discover. What he likes and what he dislikes. How will you ever know? If you never read the Torah, you will never know. If you never read the, the scriptures, you will never know. And so as a Jew seated there, when Jesus says, the will of my Father, what is the first thing that will come into your mind is, how do I know the will of God, our Father? Everything in the Old Testament, as has been unveiled at this point in time, we are sitting here at the northern shore of the Galilee. We should be refreshing our minds that, oh, that is what God would like. He would bless if we do this, and He would curse and destroy when we do that. And so this is how we know. Knowing what God likes, we will do. Knowing what God dislikes, we won't do. Now, the contrast is practice. Lawlessness. Big word. Practice means this is a habit. It's habitual. Every day you do this. What is lawlessness? Antinomia, right? Or you get the English word, antinomian. It merely means this. Against the law. But that really doesn't capture the essence. Antinomia or lawlessness means, very simply, law, no law. That you are living a life habitually ignoring the Torah. Which means that we are ignoring the directions of God. We are ignoring the instructions of God. And so practicing lawlessness means a life habitual of ignoring God, doing things which God is not desirous, which means that you are not doing the will of our Father. So no Torah or lawlessness is the opposite of will of my Father. This would be with the Torah. How would you know what God wants or don't want, it's in the Torah. Read Deuteronomy chapter 28. We would have lots to read about. But interestingly, this is what Jesus had said. And why is it so difficult? It's because of this. As we come to a close, Jesus is saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says, all right? And look at what Jesus says. It is the one who does. See, the Hebrew concept is very practical. If I say I, I want to do this, I, it's in my heart, there's nothing to do with the heart. It's about doing, acting out, walking it. See, if you see food, you cannot think of eating food. It means nothing to you. You have to be eating it, actually putting it into your mouth and swallowing it. And so the Hebrew people and the Chinese people are very similar in their attitude. This is what Jesus is saying. Don't talk. Just do the will of my Father. Practice what God wants. When you know God and you know Him as your Heavenly Father, then you would know what he wants and what he doesn't want. And when you do that, all is well. But you can't say that I used to know him, but I don't know him anymore. It doesn't matter because in that day, everything is in that day. The judgment day is when you cross into that gate. And that is how the Jews will understand this. 
So let me conclude. I only have one slide to conclude. This is the only thing I want all of us to, to try to work things out. When you read the Gospels, try, try very hard to understand it from the viewpoint of Jesus and the Jewish audience. Put yourself there. I've tried to help us see that. So you need to go back and play the video again and, and look at the words, what it means, because that would give you the Hebrew context. Not the English dictionary, not the Greek dictionary, but the Hebrew. Don't jump into the English language because the terminology, idiom, the Bible verses, the traditions, and all these matter. Jesus always comes from the viewpoint of the Torah. Jesus never comes and say, well, let's forget about the Torah. Because in the mind of the Jews, it is not about do's and don'ts. It's about blessings and curses, about promises, how we live, and he is our father. And so Jesus will never, ever contradict his father. And Matthew 4, 7 talks about repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the Sermon on the Mount, where we have read, also speaks about the kingdom of heaven. It is not spiritual. It is very physical that they are looking forward to that day. And lastly, please do not impose our modern 21st century ideas, definitions, thinking, culture, and practices into the text. The moment you do that, we will come away with new ideas of what the text never said. And that, I think, is a bit dangerous. And so let me leave this with you. And I wish you well in your pursuit. I hope you're not too shocked about this. But more importantly is to really look hard and see, is this a better way of looking at the Gospels? Isn't this what Jesus is trying to tell us? Are we not trying to help un ourselves understand from his perspective or from the audience initial perspective then we can take the principle and apply it to ourselves any questions okay well i i hope that it is uh, it's something that, that should shake us up and, and help us understand the text. I, I'm just concerned about the text. How we apply it to our modern day can only come after we understand the text. Based on your presentation this evening, um, obviously it shows uh, quite, uh, would it show quite clearly that Jesus obviously taught in Hebrew rather than Greek because of all the idioms and things there because there's always this standing challenge uh, even within scholars and things like that and they, they insist that the New Testament which means the Gospels uh, and, uh, and the epistles are all actually originally written in Greek. How should we look at this? Because from what you have shared with us this evening, it, it, it takes a very, very different slant at how we should be reading uh, 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 the New Testament. I mean the Gospels, if if it's such, then it should be Hebrew. But would that same investigation should be put also onto the uh, episodes, maybe the Pauline episodes, that maybe it's not really in Greek and many of those things are actually uh, Hebrewic in, 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 in nature? Ah, okay. Um, what we do have are Greek documents. And because we have majority Greek documents, uh, the scholars have tended to read the Gospels and the New Testament, particular Gospels, from a Greek perspective to look at what the Greek words actually mean. And so for a long time, we've been struggling with the Gospels that way. This evening, I had tried to show us the, the Hebrew approach. And the reason why I have argued for the Hebrew approach is because Jesus is a Jew. And the audience are all Jews. And so when they speak, they would speak Jewish idioms and Jewish terminology. Now, since we don't have an ancient 
Hebrew Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, although we do have some, some documents in Hebrew, uh, they, they, they are not the oldest, but they do shed light. Now, I didn't refer to those, but more importantly is when we read the Gospels, um, even by looking at the text from a Hebrew meaning, will actually uh, open up the text to a, a, a totally different world. Uh, than what we have been used to. And so that's why up front I've asked for us to set aside what we have previously learned and, and see it from Jesus' view. I would, no, I would venture to tell us that Jesus taught the Torah uh, in Hebrew. Uh, he would have spoken in Hebrew. He would have given the meanings in Hebrew. He wouldn't have had any Greek meaning in his words at all. Uh, in, in a couple of episodes ago, I had tried to show that the word repent, for example, uh, cannot change its meaning from the Hebrew. It has to be Hebrew. It cannot be Greek. And so all these words that is there in the Sermon on the Mount, if when we understand it in the Hebrew context, actually explains a whole lot more. I think that would be an easier way to look at it. Uh, perhaps even in the New Testament, the rest of the New Testament, uh, if you read it from a Hebrew perspective, uh, especially when you're talking about definitions, terminologies, idioms, uh, and, and Old Testament quotations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yes. Is it possible for you to um, expand on Matthew 6 verse 33? Uh, it's so often quoted seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So from the Hebrew perspective, is there a different stance? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Actually, the the, the the understanding is actually quite simple. Uh, the, the intent that Jesus was actually using there is don't, don't worry about what you eat and drink. Um, and, and I think it's important for us to realize when we read into the context of that passage in chapter 6 is the Hebrew people are very similar to the Chinese people. Eat and drink. And then eat, drink and clothe. What you wear, what you eat, what you drink. And so whenever they come together, it's all about eating and drinking which is very similar to us. And so Jesus says, don't worry about all these. First, you seek. Now, seeking is like enter. You know, they are all very practical, action-oriented words. Look first. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't, do and don't work and, and don't do anything else, but the priority. And so this would be what we mean by priority. If you have what, what the knowledge of the kingdom of God is and what is his righteousness, that would be the key. So it is all about God. To know God and to walk with God. This is a fundamental Hebrew thinking because when, when they came to this point, they forgot how they were in the wilderness, how they were when they left Egypt. And so this was, the whole thing is to come back one full circle. Why did God make the first month of their year, the celebration of the Passover, is so that they always remember that there is always God who had delivered them from Egypt. And in their, 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 their path in the wilderness, God had taken care of them. So to, first to know God. And then to walk with God. And that would be how, from a Hebrew perspective, that we would understand this. Uh, otherwise, in the English language, we could actually expand this to, to I guess, practically anything else. Um, and, and it's to remind them, eating, drinking, and clothing, God knows that it's important. But if you don't know God, then what? that is not as important as this. All right? Yes, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah okay. I hope that you can actually go through the rest of the passages yourself and, and, and wrestle through. 
I can I can assure you, you would be amazed to see so many, so much more things, and so much more meaningful things uh, that is that you you never thought you you knew. So let's call it a day. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.